S through J. Okay, so uh, nucleus stores DNA, nucleolus uh, controls protein synthesis, copies RNA. Okay, nuclear membrane basically only allows um, DNA or RNA in and out through the pores. What does the rough ER do? Transports protein. Okay, smooth ER had lots of jobs. It detoxifies poisons. Okay, what else? What? It repairs stuff. It repairs, I would say, stuff would be not as detailed as I'd be looking for. What stuff does it repair? Membranes. membranes right? It makes lipids to repair membranes. Okay, so we've got detoxifies poisons, makes lipids to repair membranes. What else? It breaks down complex carbohydrates. Breaks down complex carbohydrates. Produces fat soluble hormones. Okay, lots of jobs. All right, uh, then we talked about the uh, little bumps that were all over the, um, the rough ER, the ribosomes. What do they do? It takes the RNA that's Right, it takes the RNA that's been made from the nucleolus and makes protein. Then we talked about the Golgi apparatus. Next, I think. Okay, what does the Golgi do? Uh, it's it get packages up when you stand. Yeah, you want to and other things to add explosive. Right. It packages wastes and gets rid of, or and then packages for export. Okay, the things that want to be secreted by the cell. All right. Um, lysosomes. They were just on a quiz, so we should definitely know that one. Digestion. Digestion. Okay, they digest food, and they would only be present in animal, animal cells. What about a carnivorous plant? Would a Venus flytrap have lysosomes? Actually, it doesn't. Okay, uh, it can produce digestive enzymes, but the digestion is completely external. Okay, so the digestion occurs in the trap, not in the cells. Okay, it doesn't really, a Venus flytrap, well, it does consume organisms like some flies and stuff like that. It doesn't get a lot of food energy out of them. It's more like nutrients and things like that than it is actual food energy. Okay, they're still primarily a photosynthetic organism. If they relied solely on the bugs they could catch for food, they'd all stop. Okay, because if you've ever had a Venus flytrap, okay, they don't catch a lot of bugs without you, like, putting them in the trap with a pair of tweezers and waiting for it to close on them. Okay? They're not exactly the greatest okay, at catching things. Um, all right, so uh, peroxisomes. You got the same people answering all the time. I'm going to start picking other people. Seth, what do peroxisomes do? Uh, they're lysosomes that just have to come into contact with food. They are lysosomes that haven't come into contact with food yet. Good. All right, um, cytoplasm. We wrote that one in at the end, didn't we? Uh, that's a chloroplast. Oh. But you're right, that's what a chloroplast does. Cytoplasm. Um, a medium that fills the line of the cell and facilitates diffusion. Awesome. A medium, liquid medium that fills the cell and facilitates diffusion. We wrote it in at the end of the day. Uh, cell membrane. Two words. And they both end the same. Endocytosis and exocytosis. Good. All right. Um, cell wall. Supports the cell. Supports the cell. Water vacuole. Um, increases trigger pressure of water to support the cell within. Uses trigger pressure to support the cell from within. Uh, centrioles. Aids the cell in division. And what kind of cell are they in? Um, animal cells. Animal cells only. Did I miss anything? The mitochondria. The mitochondria, that's what I missed. What do they do? Jock, what do they do? Cellular respiration. Cellular respiration. Okay, so is that the kind of thing that's going to be on Tuesday's quiz? Yes. Definitely. Tuesday's quiz, picture of a cell with labels coming out of it. You have to tell me what that thing is and what it does. All right.
and that's what you'll be expected to be able to do by Tuesday. All right. Now, uh, after we got done talking about all the parts of the cell, we moved on to cellular transport. Okay, um, so we talked about diffusion. Okay, and diffusion is super important because it is basically the only way materials move through the cytoplasm of the cell. All right, diffusion is a passive process that simply happens. The cell has no control over it, but it's also free. And it is the natural movement of materials from high concentration to low concentration or down the concentration gradient. The example we used yesterday was what happens if someone farts on one side of the room, okay, and how that smell slowly, hopefully, dissipates before reaching other parts of the room. Okay, that's essentially diffusion, okay? And we talked about how diffusion is like free shipping. Okay, it's slower, okay? Um, it's not targeted, right? So it just kind of goes everywhere as a shotgun approach to transporting stuff. Um, whereas some of the other stuff we're gonna talk about is much more targeted, and as a result, is faster. But you have to pay for it, okay? That's what we're gonna talk about today when we talk about active transport. Diffusion is really important because tomorrow we're going to do an activity to do with the effect of cell size on a cell's ability to transport by diffusion. Okay, because we said it's a shotgun approach, right? So as the stuff moves away from the area of high concentration, okay, it spreads out pretty quickly. It's not very fast, and if it's always spreading out and becoming less and less concentrated, the further it has to go, the less of it is going to get there. Okay? That's kind of the drawback of diffusion. And it's also the reason, generally, why cells have kind of an upper limit to their size. Okay? Why there aren't like giant amoebas like sitting in a desk with us. Right? It's just not effective to transport materials by diffusion. Right. If you had to, let's say, transport the oxygen that you can get in your lungs to the muscles of your legs by diffusion, you would be like a cramped, horrible mess because it just would take forever to get there. Okay. It's why we have a circulatory system that actively pumps blood carrying oxygen to the parts of our body that need it. Okay. If it had to go there by diffusion, it could take hours. Right. That's just not an effective way for that to happen. All right, then we talked about osmosis, and osmosis, we have to remember, is the transport of only water. Okay? It is the passive transport of water, and it is across the cell membrane, okay? and it does that to balance or gain an equilibrium, okay? mostly to do with salts. We talked yesterday about how if you put salt on a slug, it'll shrivel up. Okay? And the reason it'll shrivel up is because osmosis is a passive process that cells cannot control. It simply happens. And the water would be drawn out of the cell towards the salts by the osmotic pressure created by the difference in concentration. Lots of salts outside, almost no salts inside, and the water is just going to be drawn out by what we call osmotic pressure. It is also how plants transport water. Okay, we talked about how the polar nature of water is important in that. The polar nature of water really keeps water from falling back down, but doesn't exert a force that pulls up. The force that pulls water up a plant is osmosis. As water evaporates out of the leaves, the salts and minerals that are in it get left behind. Okay, like if you boil off tap water, what's left in the pan? Minerals. Don't do that at home. Okay? If you accidentally leave water boiling on the stove, it's going to smell really bad in your house. Right? Because it'll boil off all the water, and all the minerals that were in the water will be left behind on the pan, and they will char and burn onto the pan, and it smells really bad, and it can ruin the pan. Okay? Um, so that stuff that's in water, I mean, plants live in dirt, so the water they take out of the dirt is full of minerals and salts. Okay? As, that's, as that stuff goes up in, into the leaves, it evaporates from the leaves, and the salt gets left behind. So now there's a whole bunch of salt in the leaf, and way less salt everywhere else. So water naturally moves towards that higher salt concentration in the leaves, which is upwards against the force of gravity, 
costs the plant nothing. Okay? The plant doesn't have to expend any energy to transport water against gravity from its roots to its leaves. And for some like giant trees, that could be like 100 meters or more. Okay? It takes no energy to do that whatsoever. Right? That's because of osmosis. So when you are in grade 12, I think, you do this lab on osmosis, where you have this horseshoe-shaped test tube. And across the middle of it, you put sausage casing. So if you've ever had like a, a hot dog or a sausage or anything like that, it's meat and it's stuffed into a tube that's made of skin, or actually intestinal lining okay, from, a, from an animal. Right? So it's basically just cells. Okay? It's a membrane. And so you put it across the middle of this tube, and on one side, you put like tap water, and on the other side, you put salted tap water. And what will happen is the water will move from this side, where there's very little salt, to this side. And over the course of time, what you'll actually see is the water level rise on the salty side. And that'll keep happening until what? Osmosis will continue until equilibrium is achieved. Okay? If equilibrium cannot be achieved, osmosis will continue until there is catastrophe. Okay? And that's what can happen if you drink salt water. Okay? If you drink salt water, you put a bunch of minerals in your body. Okay? That, those minerals get into your tissues and your blood, and they draw water out of your cells further dehydrating you. Okay? Your kidneys get rid of that excess salt in urine, okay? which means you've now actually lost water. And it's a lot. For every liter of salt water that you consume, you'll lose a liter and a half of your own. Okay? So it doesn't take long for you to lose water because of drinking salt water. Okay? And the problem is, is that as you become dehydrated, you feel even more thirsty. More and until catastrophe. Okay, you just your body cannot regain its salt balance. Okay, and you die of thirst, essentially dehydration. Okay, um, this is also why restaurants, okay, and bars will serve salty appetizers. If you eat salty food, you will feel thirsty, and you'll buy more. It's an upsell. Okay? Some places, not that you guys are old enough to know this, okay? but lots of places in like bars and stuff, they'll have deals or even give you like free popcorn or pretzels because they're salty. Okay? Pretzels and popcorn are super cheap. And they make you thirsty, so you buy more drinks. Okay? And you spend more money in their establishment. And it's all about osmosis. Okay? It's using science to make money. Science is good. Uh, this is also, um, every once in a while we get the gospel reading about putting old wine in new wineskins, okay, or new wine in old wineskins, and then they'll burst, okay, I don't know if anyone remembers that, okay, but we get it fairly often, at least once or twice a year, okay, um, that's osmosis, okay, if, back in, back in the day they stored wine in skins, okay, because they didn't have glass, uh, and pottery wasn't good for that. So they would put it in skins, literally animal skins, all right? And they would seal up the top. Now, what would happen over time is the minerals and tannins and things like that that were in the wine would be absorbed by the skin, okay? And then, when the wine was gone, if you put fresh wine in that skin, the cells that that skin was made of already had lots of the tannins and minerals and salts in them. So water would move out of the wine and into the skin to the point where the skin cells would balloon and the skin would burst. Okay? And the wine, which would be ruined already by the fact that it's losing all of that water, okay, would ruin the skin and be lost. Okay? Simply a osmosis. Okay. All right. Everybody clear on osmosis? Okay. On a test, this is how I would test this. 
I would give you a real world situation and ask you which cellular transport process is going on in this situation and how does it work in this situation. So let's say I talk about putting, um, putting a slug in salt water. Okay. Which cellular transport process is that going to be? <coughs> Diffusion, osmosis, or active transport? We haven't talked about active transport, so that's not the answer. Which one do you think it would be? It would be osmosis. Okay. If it has to do with salts and water, it's osmosis. Okay. Osmosis can only transport what? Water. Okay. So if the question is about water, it's probably it's got to be about osmosis. Diffusion, we don't worry about water. Diffusion transports everything. Okay? Anything that can be transported by the cell can be transported by osmosis. All right? And the, the question would also probably say something like, within the cell, how does this stuff go somewhere? Well, within the cell would mean by diffusion, because osmosis works across the membrane, not from one place to another in the cell. So you kind of have to know the key characteristics of each transport process so that in a situation like that, you can identify which one I'm asking about and then explain it to me. Okay? All right. The last one is um, active transport. So diffusion and osmosis are passive. They happen no matter what. Cell can't control them. Active transport uses energy. So the cell actively carries out this process and uses energy to do it. So by comparison, would it be faster or slower than the other two? Faster. Faster. This is the shipping you pay for. Right? This is the shipping you pay for. So it goes faster. Okay? The cell is using energy to make this happen. Right? It is still transport across the membrane. Okay? But unlike osmosis, this is the movement of minerals. Okay? Osmosis is the movement of water. Okay? Active transport is the movement of minerals and ions and things like that. Okay? It's actively pumping them against the gradient. Okay? Osmosis and diffusion can only achieve equilibrium. Active transport can actively build up an increased concentration. Okay? So if I've got osmosis going on, across a membrane, water is just going to move until the salts are equal. Active transport is going to pump salts across, okay, not water, but pump the salts across so that one side is way more concentrated than the other. Okay? Passive processes can't do that. Passive processes can attain equilibrium. Active transport cannot do it. Okay? And that's what it's trying to do. So if your cell suddenly needs a whole bunch of something inside, active transport is what it's used. Your nerves and muscles use this all the time. Okay? When you um, fire a nerve impulse or you contract a muscle, okay, which basically is both a nerve impulse and contracting a muscle at the same time, okay, um, ions quickly switch places during that contraction. Sodium and potassium switch places across the cell membrane during that firing or contraction. In order for that muscle to contract properly or that nerve to fire properly again, they have to be pumped back to the other place really quickly. Okay? So they use active transport. Right? If you start to get an imbalance of minerals, okay, the active transport, especially if you get dehydrated, the active transport doesn't work nearly as well, and muscles begin to fatigue. And then, if they don't get their mineral balance, they get a cramp. Okay? That's because the muscle can't unclench. Okay? It means that the active transport isn't working anymore. It's not getting the minerals pumped back to the right side of the cell. Okay? And so the muscle cannot relax. And it just tightens and tightens and tightens into that painful knot. Okay? So you have to get it worked out, usually manually. Okay? You have to drink lots of water to try and flush those minerals back to where they're supposed to go so that active transport or sodium potassium pump can work properly. All right, so active transport, the big thing with active transport is that it is the pumping of solutes against the gradient. 
So from low concentration to high concentration, the opposite of what the other two do. Okay? It uses energy. And it is across the membrane. Okay, so this is not how a cell can transport material inside the cell from A to B. That's still diffusion. That's the only way. This just gets material across or into the cell, okay, or out of the cell. All right. So the way that this works, we talked about how your cell membrane the other day isn't like a layer of fats, but that it's this like jello salad looking thing that's full of you know proteins and stuff like that. Some of the proteins that are embedded in your cell membrane are called carrier proteins. Carrier proteins are what do the active transport, what do the pumping of the material. Right? So when energy is applied to them, they change shape. So this is outside the cell here, where the concentration of ions is lower. Okay? Here are the ions, these circles. So the carrier proteins are open to the outside and the ions move in to the carrier protein. When energy is expended and applied to that carrier protein, it changes shape. And you can see it goes from looking like this to looking like this. Okay? It changes shape, and now that material has been pumped into the cell. The more they do that, they actually can create a flow that pulls those ions in. Okay? But it's the carrier proteins that use energy to do that. Okay? Everybody follow me there? Right, so this thing here about carrier proteins, super important. Okay? Make sure you add that in there. It's the carrier proteins that change shape. Okay? Make sure you add that to your notes. Okay? That it's the carrier proteins changing shape that cause the pumping. Okay? And that's going to use energy. are the first three methods of cellular transport. I call them the big three because they're the most important. Okay? They're the ones used most often okay, by the cell. The rest of the cell transport stuff we're going to talk about are much different mechanically. Okay? These have to do with concentrations. They're only moving small things, but they can move them fairly quickly and in fairly large amounts. Some stuff that needs to get into the cell or out of the cell is too big to fit through these carrier proteins or to move across the membrane. Not a lot of things can move across the membrane. Water and ions. That's basically it. Okay. What if a cell needs to take in something bigger? What's it going to do? Well, it can't really force its way through. If something forces its way through the membrane, the membrane will rupture, and then the cell is going to die. Sorry for the interruption, but could we now have grade 10, last name starting K through zero, O, not zero, O. Could you please come down if you would like a retake? And that is in the cafeteria. So that's K through O, grade 10, or a retake. Okay. Um, so if something bigger needs to get through, we talked actually a little bit about this yesterday. Um, a cell will use a change of shape of its membrane. Okay? There's three reasons that a cell will, will actually engulf something. It's food, it's water, or it's a hormone. Okay? All of those things are too big okay, um, to get through the membrane. Water can get through the membrane, but sometimes a cell needs to pull water in faster than osmosis can move it. Okay? And if it does, it's going to engulf fluid okay, and bring it into the cell that way as well. Okay? The engulfing doesn't rupture the membrane. The membrane literally wraps around something and pulls it into the cell. The example I used yesterday was picking up after your dog. Okay? So if you, you put the, the little plastic bag around your hand, okay, you pick up the poop and then you turn the bag inside out, that's what happens when a cell needs to engulf something 
and take it in, and it's too big to fit through the membrane. The membrane will just wrap around it. Okay. All right. So transport out of the cell, we already said is called exocytosis. This is the reverse of what I just described. Okay. So this is a vesicle coming from the Golgi, most likely, going to the membrane. As it goes to the membrane, okay, once it touches the membrane, because it's made out of exactly the same material as the membrane, it just becomes part of the membrane. And when it does that, whatever was inside of it, these little blue lines, pop out of the cell. Okay? All exocytosis is done that way. Whether it's something we want to export, or whether it's waste products, or whatever, a, a vesicle will meet up with the membrane, merge with it, and whatever was inside that membrane pops out into the outside. Okay? That's exocytosis, movement out of the cell. Okay? That's one of the things the membrane controls. Okay? Endocytosis, there's three types of endocytosis. Okay? Endocytosis is the opposite, so it's picking up with the dog food. Okay? It's something merges with the membrane and the membrane engulfs it. All right? So uh, if we're talking about pinocytosis, Pinocytosis is just something the cell does if it's really dehydrated. And it really needs to pull water in faster than osmosis can make it happen. Okay? It will just start engulfing okay, um, water, like cell gulping. Okay? It's just going to gulp water by just engulfing a whole bunch of it. Okay? If a cell needs to feed, that means some particle has, that's food has encountered the membrane. The cell can recognize that. And it will engulf it by exactly the same process. The membrane will simply go around it, merge, and form a vesicle that will come in. And when that merges with a peroxisome, it will become a lysosome and digestion will occur. Okay? This is how your immune system kills stuff. Okay? Your um, T cells go around and they engulf bacteria and things like that uh, in order to kill them. And they kill them by eating them. Okay? And the last thing that can cause endocytosis is what we call RME, receptor mediated endocytosis. So I said one of the things that's on the surface of the membrane are these little antenna-like things called receptors. When they are triggered, that is the signal that they're supposed to receive lands on them, the cell will engulf the signal, okay? because hormones are fairly large proteins for the most part. And they can't just force their way through the membrane. They have to be engulfed. Okay? When they're engulfed and the receptors are with them, they very quickly move through the cell to wherever they are needed. Okay. All right, so those are the three types of endocytosis. Endocytosis and exocytosis are much less important than the big three diffusion, osmosis, and active transport. Okay? I'm never going to ask a written response question about endocytosis or exocytosis. It'll be like multiple choice. But if I give you a real world situation and it's about cellular transport, it's about one of the big two. Okay? Those three are far more important. Okay, so as we said, phagocytosis is the engulfing of a solid particle usually food, all right? The process is the same. It's the engulfing, it's the changing of shape of the membrane, okay? That's a cytosis, the changing of shape of the membrane, okay? All the changes is the prefix, okay? Because it deals with whether it's solid, liquid, or a chemical signal of some kind, okay? So if it's phagocytosis, it's cell eating. It's food or something like that, okay? If it's pinocytosis, it's cell drinking or gulping. Right? And it's literally taking in interstitial fluid, water, okay, in, into the cell quickly. Under an electron microscope, it actually looks like this here on the right. Okay? So you can see here, this is, this is the cell, this is the nucleus, okay? right here, this is the nucleus here. Okay? And here, each one of those is a pinocytotic vesicle. That means the cell membrane is pulling in and engulfing the fluid. Okay. 
And the last one, receptor-mediated endocytosis. So the receptors on the membrane have been triggered by their chemical signal, and the cell membrane engulfs them, right? And it literally... Okay, um, so it literally looks like what they've got drawn here. All right, you can kind of see the receptors. Okay, they're right here. Okay, and you can see that they've got something in them. Okay, when that happens, okay, that's what triggers the cell membrane to wrap around them okay, and bring them into the cell. So mechanically, they're all the same. The cell membrane wraps around and engulfs them. The reason is what causes them to be different. It's either a chemical signal about water or about food. Okay, everybody with me there? So these would be multiple choice items. Okay, if a cell engulfs a food particle. It's called A, kenocytosis, B, receptor-mediated endocytosis, C, phagocytosis, D, all of the above. Okay. All right, I would like you guys to see if you can answer these questions. They're, some of them you actually have to think about. They're not something you can go back into the notes and just find the answer. Okay? Some of them you have to think about a little bit. So I'll give you a few minutes on that. So color blindness is caused by a person's cells being unable to produce certain proteins. Where in the cell does the problem lie? Okay, it's close. The fact, if, if it was the nucleolus or it was the ribosomes, the problem would be it wouldn't be able to produce any proteins. So what tells the nucleolus and the ribosomes how to make certain proteins? Your, well, not your RNA, but your, your DNA. Okay? Color blindness is genetic. And so if, there, if you're colorblind, it's because your DNA has a mistake in it, basically. Okay? Your section of DNA that codes for how to make rhodopsin, okay, which is a protein used by your eyes to sense color, okay, is it's wrong. And it doesn't, whatever the whatever your DNA says doesn't make that protein. And so as a result, you can't see certain wavelengths of light. All right? Uh, you guys remember Mr. Banner sucked for me a couple times? Okay? He's colorblind. Like, totally colorblind. When he retired, we got him those glasses that help colorblind people see color. It was really cool to see somebody put those on. Because right? um, he's like, that's green? Never seen green before. Okay? I had never seen green. We always used to play games with him. Because okay? he would come in, and one day, I was wearing blue pants with a checkered shirt that was blue and orange. And he came in, and he was wearing, like, black pants. No brown pants with a checkered purple shirt because he got out of the house before his wife saw what he was wearing. And he didn't match. And when he came up to me, it was exactly the same pattern of checkered shirt. He's like, hey, look, we're twins. And I'm like, yeah, we are. And he walked up, look, everybody, we're twins. Like, it just, like... I felt bad afterwards, but I mean, he knows. We make fun of him all the time because he's colorblind, okay? Like, he, he'd never seen green, like, he, and there's a lot of different colors he didn't really have a sense of. People who are colorblind kind of compensate for that, okay? Like, if you're colorblind, how can you tell the difference between a red light and a green light? Top or bottom, left or right. That's why green lights are always on the bottom or on the right, okay? It's for colorblind people. So that they know that light's green, even though they don't know that that light is green. Okay? They know that's the position of the green light. Okay, does that sort of make sense? All right, so, yeah, it can be pretty tricky. Yeah. I have a question. Okay. So, my dad, he, he got blind in one eye a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And it happened during COVID. And nobody has really known what it is. Like, would it be like a, a part of like, the DNA or just like. Probably not a genetic thing, I wouldn't think. Uh, but there's lots of like disorders that can happen, like um, glaucoma, things like that. I, honestly, I wouldn't yeah, know. Yeah. Blind, like really fast, and like a week, it just started like, like, In just one eye. Yeah. I 
honestly don't know. I, I wish I could tell you why, but the fact that it would be only one eye would say to me probably not genetic. Um, genetic things usually manifest pretty quickly. Like basically you have them your whole life. Gen genetic disorders don't generally manifest later. <coughs> okay. Um, so, for question number two, why is it important for organelles to have their own membranes? Okay, that's compartmentalization. And compartmentalization is important because it gives each process its own ideal environment to carry out that process. That makes it more efficient. Okay? What might happen if the lysosome's membrane ruptured? We talked about this yesterday. What will it do to the cell? It'll eat it from the inside out. Okay? It's how a cell takes one for the team. Okay? It's self-sacrifice. If something's gone wrong with that cell, there's a possibility it could become malignant. Okay? And so the cell will destroy itself to save the rest of the cells. Uh, number four, what problems might a cell have if all the ER was removed? Please don't say die, obviously. Okay? But like, what, what will it not be able to do? Yeah, it wouldn't be able to uh, break down complex carbohydrates. It wouldn't be able to break down toxins. It wouldn't be able to repair membranes, make lipids, okay, make fat soluble hormones, right? Any of those important jobs. Cargo. And it couldn't transport protein. Yeah, and if it's rough ER, it wouldn't be able to transport protein either. Since it didn't specify, we would have to say both smooth and rough ER. Okay. All right, questions on those? All right, tomorrow we're going to be doing an activity on cell size and transport. What I want to do is do kind of the introduction for that today because we have time and tomorrow is a short class. So this, I mean, this activity is kind of designed for a short class, but um, I want to be able to get some of the intro done so that you have as much time as possible to work on it in class. The idea is that you'll get it done in class and not have any homework. I will not be taking it in at the end of class. You'll still have more time to work on it on your own. Okay? But the idea is that you could complete it in class and do a good job of it in that amount of time. Okay? So if you have your phone, you can open up the file I'm talking about because I put it into Google Classroom this morning. Okay? And it's called Cell Size and Transport Activity, I believe. Cell transport activity. Okay, so if you go there, okay, same as always, there'll be your, your Google Doc that you'll do all your work and that's what you'll submit to me. Okay, and then there's the PDF that I'll be working out of. Okay, and then there's the recording of me doing this last time. Okay, um, so that's there because it's all in one piece as opposed to two. Okay, so if you want to have your Google Doc open on your phone because they don't have the Chromebooks today. Um, you guys can kind of follow along here. Um, so, if we're looking at the big three, okay, so this chart is showing us the big three methods of cellular transport. Right? We know that osmosis is the movement of water across a membrane to balance solutes or salts. We know that diffusion can move anything. All materials can move by diffusion. And cells use that within the cytoplasm, so inside the cell, or intracellular transport. And that moves materials from high concentration to low concentration. Its drawback is that it is slow and it is not targeted. Okay? It is not going to make sure that substance A ends over there. Okay? It's just going to probably get some there. Okay, by that shotgun approach to cellular transport. Right, those are the drawbacks. The pluses for diffusion are that it's free. And over small distances, quite effective. This is where this activity comes in. Diffusion is effective over small distances. If a cell becomes too big, it's not going to work efficiently. Right? And the other thing is active transport. This activity is not about active transport, but it uses energy. It moves materials against the gradient okay, across the membrane. So this one and this one are across the membrane. Diffusion is inside the cell, and that's the one we're focusing on with this activity. Okay. 
So um, you might want to add this paragraph to your notes somewhere, because it's not in there right now. Okay? Cells absorb nutrients and excrete wastes through their membrane. That's the only way stuff gets in or out. Okay? That membrane represents their surface area. Okay? So their membrane is their surface area. They have to transport whatever comes through that membrane by diffusion through their cytoplasm, which is their volume. Okay? Now, surface area is a two-dimensional measurement. Volume is a three-dimensional measurement. Okay? Like if you calculate the surface area or the area of a square, you get it in like meters square. Okay? But if you calculate the volume of a cube, you get it in cubic meters, okay, or meters cubed. Right? So they, they measure different things. The issue for a cell is that if a cell gets bigger, both of those things get bigger. Its surface area has to increase, and its volume has to increase. Sorry, I was trying to flip on that. Okay. Um, which one do you suppose increases faster, the surface area or the volume? As a cell gets bigger, which one gets bigger faster? The volume. The volume. Okay. Think about how we calculate volume. We calculate volume by taking the length of something times its width times its height. If we're calculating the surface area, it's only length times width. There's only two dimensions. So when something gets bigger, only two numbers get bigger. But when I'm looking at the volume, three numbers that I'm multiplying together get bigger. So this gets bigger faster. And that's the problem for a cell. It's got all this volume that stuff has to move through that's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But its surface area, the thing it uses to get the stuff it needs, isn't getting bigger that fast. Okay? So it's like you're getting bigger and bigger and bigger, but you've got less and less to eat. Okay? And so as a result, you're going to start failing. Okay? And you're not going to be able to get rid of your waste either. The only way to get rid of waste is through the membrane. But now that waste spends more time in the cell because it takes longer for it to get out because okay? it has to move by diffusion. Right? So when a cell gets big, the, the kind of drawbacks of diffusion start becoming very evident and quite problematic. So. Let's say we're looking at these two cells. Okay. Let's say that these two cells have the same number of organelles, even though they're different sizes. Okay. And this material that I need to transport needs to go from this organelle to this organelle. Okay. So it's got to go from here to here. That means it's got to go this far. And the only way it can do that is by diffusion. So if it's moving there by diffusion, here it's very, very concentrated. Okay? So there's lots of it right here. But as it moves away from this through a three-dimensional volume, what happens to the concentration of this stuff? it gets less and less because it's going into more and more volume. Okay? It's the same amount of material, but by the time it's gotten kind of this far, now how spread out is it? Pretty spread out. How much of that stuff actually got where I needed it? Not very much. Right? A bunch of it ended up over here. It was needed here. But it was also in low concentration over here. It just wasn't needed over there. Diffusion doesn't know that. Diffusion doesn't care. It just goes from high to low. Well, low is everywhere else. Okay? If I'm dealing with this cell that's now much smaller, 
but has all the same machinery, it's capable of making just as many of those little purple dots. But by the time they get this far, because now they only have to go here, okay? Are, they, are quite a bit more of them getting where they need to go. So that's the problem with a cell getting too big. Its volume gets big really fast, and diffusion can't keep up with the demand. So as long as the cell stays small, diffusion works just fine. But once a cell reaches a certain size, diffusion can't handle the job anymore. Okay, does that sort of make sense? So um, this would be kind of like, if I needed to get, if I was like an Amazon delivery driver, okay, and I needed to go from you know somewhere in Okotoks to somewhere else, it doesn't take me very long to get there. Okay? But if I gotta go from South Calgary to Airdrie, okay, or even just to like Country Hill, like on the north end, does it take me a lot longer? It does. Okay? Especially if there's no like, you know, if Deerfoot's jammed and Stony is jammed, then I gotta take all the it takes forever to get there. Okay, that's kind of what's going on here. As the cell gets bigger, the amount of time it takes to get from one place to another is going to increase significantly. Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at tomorrow. With this, this we're going to simplify this. Our cells are going to be cubes. Okay, just because it's easier to calculate the surface area of a cube and the volume of a cube than it is to calculate the surface area and volume of a cell that's irregularly shaped. Right, so we're just going to imagine our cells are cubes. So if I want to calculate the surface area of a cube, I take the length times the width times the number of sides. A cube has six sides. Okay, that's how we calculate surface area. All right, if I was calculating the surface area of If I was trying to calculate the surface area of that, okay, it's getting worse. Okay, I'm going to stop. Okay, let's say it's kind of like not a cube, but it's kind of rectangular. Okay, so it's just like a not a cube. I can't remember what the name of the shape is. How would I calculate the surface area of that? I can't just go length times width times the number of sides because the sides aren't all the same now. So what I would have to do is calculate the surface area of this side and multiply it by 2 because this side over here would be the same. Surface area of the top, multiply it by 2 because the bottom would be the same. Surface area of the end, multiply it by 2 because the back would be the same. Okay, everyone kind of follow me there? Okay, just geometry, it's like junior high geometry. Okay, but we'll have to do a little bit of that tomorrow. How would I calculate the volume? Could I still go length times width times height for this? Okay, so that's what we're going to be looking at. We're just going to be looking at cubes and other shapes of different sizes and see how their surface area and their volume relate as they change both shape and size. Don't pack up. There's six minutes left and I'm using it all. Okay. Now, the way this is going to start out, okay, so like your hypothesis, there's not any variables. This, is a, this isn't a full lab. This is just an activity that we're doing. Okay, so there's no variables, there's no design, you don't have to do manipulated responding controls here. All right, we're going to go straight to the hypothesis, and for this hypothesis, you're still going to need an if, and, and then statement that talks about the relationship between surface area and volume, and how that can affect transport by diffusion. Okay, basically, if a, a cell has to do this, okay, and it's getting bigger, then this is what's going to happen, kind of something along the We'll talk more about that tomorrow, but okay, that's what we'll be looking at. And we'll be looking at these imaginary organisms. Micro will represent a healthy sized single cell organism. Macro will represent an abnormally large single cell organism. Multi-micro will represent a multicellular organism. Okay? Because if you're multicellular, you can get big, but you still have this surface area to volume problem, okay? You're, you, know, you still have to transport materials a long way. 
But if you're made up of lots of little cells, does each cell have to transport very far? It doesn't, okay? And so stuff like that can work a little bit better because what we're going to see tomorrow is the surface area and volume of this one and this one are actually okay. This one's the one that's back. All right, so that's what we're going to look at tomorrow in terms of those sizes and shapes. Okay, uh, we'll fill in this chart together, do those calculations together, okay, and then you'll have some analysis questions to do about real cells in your body, these imaginary cells that are different shapes, okay, and we'll talk about that kind of thing, right, and then um, you'll have a conclusion, and that will be it. Okay, so this will be handed in, and it'll be marked and put in your lab category, right, and like I say, you'll probably be able to get the bulk of this done in two because I took 15, 16 <laughs> minutes of what we would have needed tomorrow. Starting K through O, please call me.